Hello, everyone, and welcome to Live Questions. I'm your host, Bill Harris. We're so glad you could join us. This program attempts to keep its fingers on the pulse of believers who have questions about life. And I wish to thank you, our faithful viewers, for the questions that you have sent us to fuel some spirited discussion on this program. Our guest ministers have had time to review and research your questions, and they are here now with answers. Shall we meet them? We have Pastor Craig Flagg of Salina First Church of God, followed by Pastor Patrick Kamler of Westminster Christian Church. And then we have Pastor Randy Davis of The Bridge. And rounding up our panel is Pastor John Berger of The Transformed Church. Gentlemen, we're happy to have you with us today. Happy to be Good here. Good to be here. All All right. Right. Thank you. Diving right into the questions that viewers have sent us, I'd like to go to a question that um, tries to get us to put our fingers on the pulse of attendance at church here. Uh, in view of or in light of the, the COVID pandemic that we've been dealing with for the last two years. One viewer writes, many Christians are no longer attending church. I know there are many church-like options online, for instance. But for those who are still able to get out there and to be active, I'm concerned that it's not healthy to avoid attending church. Uh, go around and tell us, what's been <coughs> your experience about attendance during this COVID period for the last two years or so? Yeah, I think ours was pretty common. Uh, it felt like a little bit like we hit a brick wall in March of 2020. Uh, we were we would uh, had a healthy church, and and when we came back after the kind of we were shut down for 10 weeks, pretty pretty average of what churches were shut down for. Um, we had about half our church not come back, um, and so one of the things, at least, it did for me, and I'm sure it did for <coughs> some of y'all, is. It, it kind of removed that attendance idol from me, painfully. Uh, I would have said there probably wasn't one, if I'm honest, beforehand. I would have said, no, you know, I'm, I'm here to... But when you see half of your church, and there was no besetting sin, there was no church drama, there was no split. In 10 weeks, half your folks are gone. And, and to be honest, a lot of those folks didn't show back up. They, you know, they were kind of gone for good. So we've definitely seen... A, a roller coaster, mm -hmm. um, and even into 2022 uh, in <coughs> January when Omicron was kind of going nuts, we had some very low attendance uh, then. So for me, at least, it's been just a reminder of God calls us to shepherd who's in front of us, um, and and at least that's what it's taught me. Excellent. You know, we uh, we shut down. I think it was for seven or eight weeks. I don't exactly remember now, but kind of somewhere in that neighborhood. And uh, I was actually very surprised to see everyone come back. Our, our church returned to, to full attendance pretty quickly. And uh, one of the things that it, you know, kind of going along with attendance, but I think every pastor, at least I did, I won't put words in anybody else's mouth, is you start to think, okay, what really should the church be <coughs> about? Mm -hmm. Because if you have this element where the, the gathering aspect of it is taken away, how do you shepherd people? How do you mm -hmm. minister to them? And it was great that everyone came back and everyone felt like it was, it was safe to come back. And we put, we had some things in place, but we didn't you know, go crazy uh, <clears throat> with it. But just what is the responsibility of the church to the minister and, and what should that look like? And one of the things that just we, I couldn't get away from was the idea of, there has to be a physical grouping of believers together. The, the online aspect of that is great, and we can touch on that a little bit more later, but there has to be a, a group of people getting together, breaking bread, sharing the word, that kind of thing. All that stuff can happen online, and, and online has been a great tool to keep a lot of things going. We were able to do services online while everything was shut down, but there still has to be that, that physical grouping of people together. That's just a human need. It's a necessity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We were gearing up to launch right when the pandemic hit. So we learned that the Lord has a sense of humor. Um, um, we didn't Amen. find it very funny at the time, but, but he did. But uh, we chose to go ahead anyway. We had a big space and, and we had a lot of room at that point because nobody was going to church. Uh, but it allowed our team the opportunity to, uh, to coalesce together. Uh, it, for me, it was a redefining and purifying of motive and, and ministry. So uh, it was a <clears throat> learning experience. So for us, we've done nothing but grow in that because when you start with basically nothing in the midst of a pandemic, anything is growth. So for us, we've been, I think, probably like Randy, kind of the anomaly in that in, in church settings that we've grown in that. 
Um, and we learned a few things along the way, uh, similar to what you both have said already. Uh, I don't need to, to restate that, but uh, it's, God's been good in all of that. We've seen his faithfulness in all of it. Get, getting, uh, you know, <clears throat> looking at that scripture that talks about um, forsake not the assembling of yourselves Hebrews together. 10, 23, yeah, 25, no, that's what I was getting ready to share. Good, now that we're getting yeah. on the back side of yeah. COVID, is that more, does that scripture come more into play now? Absolutely, you know, and, and here, here's what it says. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how may, we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The sad part is we're in the last days. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. Satan doesn't want you to go to church because he doesn't want you to be strong. He wants you to fall. He wants you to fail. He wants you to miss it. And of all the times we need to be together spurring each other on, even you know, four pastors in a few minutes, we've already spurred each other on today. <laughs> Just by talking, sharing, encouraging. Yeah. The audience we'll leave. should have heard you all before we started recording. Exactly. <laughs> but even during the course of this taping, we will leave today re-energized with more hope, spurred on. Hey, sometimes it's frustrating in ministry, but you know what? We're going to make it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a, as a church person, you're out there. I think if you're a consumer Christian and you receive a lot, it's easy to stay home and watch it. Mm -hmm. But I don't think God calls us to be consumer Christians. I always say, you don't just go to church for you. You go to church for the other guy. Mm -hmm. Who can you encourage at church this week? Who can you serve at church this mm -hmm. week? It's not all about soaking up and getting. <laughs> but who can we go and bless at church? Mm -hmm. and, and every pastor knows 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Those 20% of people can't stand to sit in the auditorium every Sunday. they got to serve. Mm -hmm. And more, we all need to be more like that because everybody could be needs to be encouraged, especially today. But the saddest thing that's happened to me is two people that I love with all my heart, they've been adoptive grandparents to my kids. They got scared. Mm -hmm. And they haven't been back to church two years. Wow. And I just can't believe, I'm like, I mean, you're the guy who used to tell, tell me to take steps of faith. You're not moving fast enough, Pastor, you know. And now he won't even go to church. He won't get out of his house. Mm -hmm. I mean, his, his son drops mm -hmm. off his groceries on his porch. I'm like, where is that? You know, so I worry about people that are afraid mm -hmm. and maybe losing their faith. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that scares me more than just people being consumer Christians watching online. Well, and, and even kind of what you said there, there's a real concern as pastors. Are, how are we equipping our people? This was a virus. So there's a little bit of a unseen. It's, you know, it's in the air. But what if you're told you can't go to church then? Is that fear then there that goes, look, I've been told. I can't, and, and I know we kind of all wrestled with being told we couldn't, but I'm talking in a different way. I'm talking in an oppression. I'm talking an end times kind of way Absolutely. where they, where the writer of Hebrews is saying, look, you're being oppressed by famine and sword. Don't worry about that. Continue to gather. And, and I think one of the things that scared me was how quickly some folks were willing to say the assembly's not worth risk. Maybe that's the best way to say it, because I think all of us would say the assembly is worth a risk. Yeah, uh, the being with the saints, uh, and, and again, it doesn't matter whether it's 6, 16, or 600, but that community piece, there is worth some risk. Now, we need to use God's wisdom in that. We need to be wise in that. But I think God's wisdom would also dictate trust in Him, and at a certain mm -hmm. point, <clears throat> being willing to take on some risk so that we don't forsake the assembly. So does that mean putting your mask on and uh, honoring social distance? Is that what you're talking about? I think about? for some, it certainly can be. Um, and I think for some, it's just, it's trusting God in the process. I, I think all of you guys have said you met. I had to make my peace very early on that I was called to be a shepherd of God's people and that I was likely gonna get COVID and did because Ooh. I was around so many people. I made my peace with that in probably May of 2020, just because I just really, and, and maybe it was easier being a younger person and, and just kind of thinking through, but I couldn't be a pastor and not be around people. So I think there's some, there's mm -hmm. some respects of just making our peace with the situation and, and trusting God in that. Yeah, interesting. I think one of the key aspects <clears throat> in this is you can get biblical teaching online. You can yeah, listen amen. to worship music online, but it's the fellowship mm -hmm. piece that you cannot get online. Mm -hmm. Social media is not a, a legitimate place of fellowship among believers. Again, we need, we, right, right, it, right, it's toxic. <laughs> and, and so, so 
uh, when we fellowship, and that's a key biblical term, koinonia, it actually means partnership, participation, intercourse. You're doing life together with other people. You need that, especially as the scripture says that, that Randy just read, as the day draws near. Jesus is coming soon and we need fellowship now more than ever. Mm -hmm. Now is not the time to stop meeting. Now is the time really where we should be uh, investing in each other's lives personally more and more. I, a number of years ago, I interviewed a, um, a, an online pastor, I believe was his title, at one of the largest churches in the country. And because I was trying to find out more about, kind of about the online church model, this is six, seven years ago. And I said, you have someone who, who goes onto your website and they watch the, the church and they even have, you know, click the button to accept Jesus, you know, that kind of thing. Like, let, let's assume that, that that's genuine, that's legitimate. They, they offer their heart to Christ. They recognize themselves as part of your online church. What is your next step? Like, what do you, what do you advocate for those people? Because you're in Oklahoma and they're in not Oklahoma. They could be anywhere else in the world. Like they're not there. What do you advocate? And he said flat out, we recommend that they find a local church in their community that is biblically based that they can be a part of. Mm -hmm. So the online pastor of the largest church in the country suggests that you get into a local church wherever you are. So even someone who's at the forefront of that kind of technology realizes that you have to be you have to be with a body of believers. You have to be grouped in with people. And, you know, as you said, too, the, the, the social media aspect, I don't know what it is that short circuits people when they're on social media because you say things to people and you, and you make remarks to people that you would never do in real life, that you would never do face to face, probably because they might punch you. I don't know. <laughs> but there's just something about that element of relationship that is, that is fractured, that doesn't happen in the context of person-to-person -person community. Well, and I have one thought that I'll, I'll throw out to you all that I had just yesterday. I think it's impossible to truly have fellowship with the Lord if you don't have fellowship with other believers. I, I don't think you, it's, a, it's an either or thing. I think it has to be both. Mm -hmm. I think when I read the word, I see both. Mm -hmm. yeah. When Jesus was asked, how do you sum the, the Bible? What's the most important commandment? He said, love the Lord your God and yes. love your neighbor yourself. Mm -hmm. he, did, he didn't say, he, or he said, and, <laughs> and I think John, you're right. Cause you know, one of the greatest tests we have, how much we love God is how we treat people. Mm -hmm. And you know, if, if you really want to love God, God will put people in your path that are hard to love. <laughs> and, and we read in the word, if it is possible, <laughs> live at peace with everyone. Some people make it impossible, but you know what? As a believer, we should always try. Sure. And I think that's the greatest test of our faith is just how do you treat people? And, Let's face it, it's a nasty world today. I mean, mm. you got all these Nancys and I don't forget what they call the guys or Karens and yes. Kevins or something. And Is there a name for the guys? I don't know. Yeah, Kevins. I think it's Kevins. Oh, Kevins? Yeah. And it's like, Sorry you know, all the Kevins out in the audience. Yeah, but it's like, you know, it's sad that we live in a world where it's, it's sociably acceptable just to be rude and stupid. And, and like you said online, and, and I, I believe that. There's things you would say to a person on a phone you would never say to their face. And right. that's why if you got a serious conversation to have, you ought to be face to face. Let's talk about it, you know? Well, I'll tell you what, I want to come back in a moment. We're going to take a break, but I want to come back and talk about what's the effective way to draw non-believers in, mm -hmm. you know? Let's see what you have to say about that. Stay with us. We're just going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Don't go away, there's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastors you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. All right, we're back. Thank you for staying with us. Another viewer question that comes in, gentlemen. Um, what is the right way to bring non-believers to Christ? My friends attend a church which uses worldly music and is very casual. And this friend says that my church will never attract new Christians because we still dress nicely and our music is about, quote unquote, old style. Mm. <laughs> What, what's, what's the effective way? Is, is there just one way? Are there several different ways? How controversial do you want us to be today, <laughs> Bill? I mean, you know, we could probably split churches today. Um, the, the challenge is, I read in Mark 9, 38 through 41, teacher John, said, John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name and we told them to stop because he was not one of us. Mm -hmm. 
Jesus said, do not stop him. For no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever, not as, who, for whoever is not against us is for us. Truly I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. Mm -hmm. The challenge for all of us is, is we're different. Every one of us around this table mm -hmm. probably have different styles of how we lead people in a personal walk to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Whether it's personally, in a pulpit, however we do it. For me to judge John and how he reaches people, if John is truly reaching people for Jesus, it makes me very ignorant mm -hmm. and, and closed minded. And I think that's part of the church. When you get a style using their word, um, you think that's the only way to reach people. I, I'm, I'm going to be very cautious not to say anything about people uh, that's done under the banner of the church. I may not like it. I may not even agree with it. But if they're really reaching people for Jesus, who am I to tear it down? I mean, I think that's what Jesus said. Guys, look, they got fruit. But there's a lot of this that I don't think they have fruit. I think they have, uh, they, they bear people. But I don't know that Jesus is really coming through some of it. So I would, I would want to be very cautious. But even that, I don't think we need to spend our time worrying about people that are seemingly trying to reach people. We just need to worry, what are we doing to reach people? Mm -hmm. And how do I do it? What works for me? And it'll be different than what works for somebody else. Patrick, we've done sports. Mm -hmm. I use sports. TV 44 uses sport. I use sports to reach people for Jesus. Mm -hmm. I had a, a pastor growing up that told me my whole life, sports will send you straight to hell. Ooh. I played football. The who's who of our team was in our church. But he said, sports will send you straight to hell, boys. It'll be an idol, blah, blah, blah. And yet for 30-something years, I've used sports to reach people for Christ. So, it depends on the heart, doesn't it? I mean, it's, well, what you do with the yeah, sports. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Depends yeah. on who you root for. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, in, there gets into the question of, and I'm, I'm looking at this qu question, and there is a lot to do with, with style. And it's one of those things that is divisive. And it really is, it should not be divisive, ultimately, mm -hmm. I think is probably the answer that we're going with here. Because there is the, the right way, quote unquote, to bring believers to Christ is authenticity. Having a genuine walk with Christ mm -hmm. and being willing to tell them about it. How you wrap that up is entirely up to you and up to your people as a church. I've worked at churches I've been pastor of churches that have the, the light shows and the big stages and, and, the, and the resource to do all this kind of stuff. I've, I'm currently pastoring a church that doesn't have that. For we, we, have the, we have the brown hymnals. The brown ones, not the black ones, because the black ones are a little too heavy. The brown ones are the ones that we want to use. So <laughs> we, we, we've seen that from different angles. But ultimately, are we leading people into a relationship with Jesus Christ? And you do that from the, the small pulpit, you do that from the large platform, but wherever you find yourself, you showcase an authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you have that, the skinny jeans and the light shows and the, or the lack thereof really doesn't matter. And you're not going to, you might draw people in with the with the, with the cool music and the four-piece band and the multimedia and all that kind of stuff, but you're not going to keep them there. If you don't show them who Christ is, yeah. they're going to get bored. They're going to go find some other place that has the worldly music and the skinny jeans and all this other kind of stuff. You're not meeting the need that they desperately have, which is Christ. Unity and diversity. We are diverse as the day is long, the four mm -hmm. of us, just in the short time we've talked this morning uh, that has come out but we're unified under the banner of Jesus and Jesus being the only answer. So the question that I think a person has to ask in all of these things is, does this glorify God and does it exalt Jesus as Lord? That the rest of it is just preference. And I, I, I've, I've explained it as we're all families and uh, we're the big family of God. And then we've got kind of individual families. Mm -hmm. And if I went to uh, Randy's Christmas, your family might, uh, deep fry a turkey and I might be standing around going it's Christmas we have ham and another and Bill might be going no we have lasagna on Christmas <laughs> right, right. that's a preference but in our mind no 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 that is how you celebrate Christmas is the, the main dish in reality it's not it's just a preference and so there are times where a family is more casual and there's a time where a family is more buttoned up my father, when he still visits our church, they don't live in the same town where I pastor, he still dresses up and I'll say, Dad, I'm wearing jeans. And he's like, you shouldn't be wearing jeans to church, let alone be <laughs> preaching in them. Yeah, and, right. and I'm sitting there, I'm like, I'm giving this sermon today. And he's like, yeah, I don't really agree with, you know, kind of thing. You better hope it's a good one, overcome the jeans type deal. Right. And it's, but it's that simple of when he comes into God's house, he feels like, 
I need to be wearing this. This is what I feel comfortable in. Yeah. That's his preference. But when we come in, it's coming in under the banner of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. right. But when we recognize that it's about a family preference and a family style, ultimately, uh, the, it, it, the style is not discipleship. The style is not. And so I think all of us would agree Sunday morning is kind of the dessert to leading new people to Jesus and, and, and a big, the, the family gathering, so to speak. But man, every time I've been effective in seeing someone come to know the Lord, it's been through that interpersonal relationship, the discipleship, the walking with them. Right. You, might, you might cast a wide net on a Sunday, but if you want to keep them, if you want to see them grow in their faith, you've got to walk alongside them. Right. That, that's an excellent point. <clears throat> My goodness, I wish more people would, would honor that, what mm -hmm. you just said. That's an excellent point. You know, and anybody can almost draw a crowd, mm -hmm. almost. Um, some just can't for whatever reason. But there, there's, there's things you can do to entice people to come to church. But I always said, I don't care why they're here. You know, back when I was a youth pastor and I'd have a crop of a bunch of cute girls, I'd have a bunch of cute guys all of a sudden start showing up to church, you know, and say, oh, they're just coming for the girls. I don't care why they came. That's when I started. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I got saved as a teenager. Hey, absolutely. Yes. And you know what? If they come for that reason, that's okay. I don't care why they came. It's, but what are we going to do with them while they're here? Yes. And that's the church's yes. role. What are we going to do with those people? However we want to reach them. What are we going to do with them when we get them? And some people, they can get them. They don't know what to do with them. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know. You can catch when, a fish, but do you know how to clean it? Yeah. And or they want to draw people just like them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when a real sinner comes in that's got some baggage and some stuff, sometimes the church don't accept it. Yeah. It's I love, like we, we got to work hard on that. We have in our church folks that have arrested other people in our church. So we have police officers who have arrested <laughs> certain folks. And I'm like, hey, man. This Amen. is what it's supposed to look like. You know, yeah. these people in the world's eyes are very different. In Christ's eyes, they're the same. They're a sinner in need of a Savior. Amen. And it's just awesome to see that at times. And I'm sure it's uncomfortable for both parties. Absolutely. But I think, it, where else does that happen? It doesn't happen at the coffee shop. It doesn't happen at the bar. Only in the house of God do we get this mingling. And that, mm -hmm. that's where there's something special. And it overrides the music we sing and the style we sing in or what version we teach out of that's where the gospel's actually happening. Yeah. And that's why we need to be very careful that we don't make our preferences, our traditions, mm -hmm. our rule for faith mm -hmm. and practice. Yep. Again, that. unity and diversity. You're not saying that enough, I'll tell you. <laughs> and, <laughs> that's so true, that's so true. And, and kind of the subtext of that too is that we've talked about the, the, the newer way to do things with, uh, with the fancier stuff as kind of the style aspect. The, the people making the argument against that are also making a style argument. It's it's their style. They think that yeah. their particular style is the right way. Or maybe yeah. someone, you know, someone that I spoke to years ago said, what you win people with, you win them to. Mm -hmm. So if you think that that's how church is supposed to go, and you don't focus in on the reason that you're there, which is Jesus Christ and knowing him more fully, then you're going to start thinking you're supposed, you're supposed to dress up, which is fine. Or you're supposed to have a smoke machine which is fine, <laughs> whatever you want to do, as long as you are providing that spark, I think, my, my opinion, on Sunday morning, that catalyst to get people more into the Word, to be more into the discipleship, to be a Christian on Monday through Saturday and not just on Sunday morning. Amen. Look at this question here, um, a viewer mm -hmm. question. In Second Kings, we read about King uh, Josiah who turned his people back to God after the discovery and reading of the Torah. But both his sons, who took over after him, were said to be evil. How can so much change in just one generation? How, how can it change? And we do see changes. With each generation, there's a new set of values, a new set of preferences, and all those kinds of things. I think this is one of those things, being a younger guy in the church, mm -hmm. and most of my colleagues are older than me, and they're like, your generation, your generation. And it's like, things don't always change for the worst. Mm -hmm. I would say the generation that uh, in 1865, the abolitionists that fought to end slavery would say that was a good change, not a bad change. So all change isn't bad. So we look at how much can change in a generation. Well, praise God, some things can change in a generation. Um, that doesn't mean all change is bad change. That said, the root of this question, I think some of us look around and we see some bad change. I'll let you guys talk about the bad change. I'll just be the like, it can be good, but right. ooh, there's some, there's some change that's maybe not so good. Well, there's a, there's a teaching by uh, Bruce Wilkinson 
on the tail of the three chairs. And he talks about how grandpa could have been a staunch Christian follower of Christ like Josiah. The son saw it, but maybe didn't experience it, but he's aware of it. But by the third generation, if the dad didn't catch it, the son never will. Ooh. And uh, if you think about that, and it's a great, I mean, if you get a chance to watch it, it's, it's some of the best teaching. Until someone has their own personal relationship with Christ, it's not going to pass it on to the next generation. But don't write off the next generation because they're not following Christ. Because there's a lot of young people that love Jesus with all their heart. And it's complicated days. It's tough times. But, you know, the, the key is, is King Josiah had an experience with God, but his boys didn't. Mm -hmm. They saw it but they never had their own experience. We gotta make sure people have their own experience, whatever age, because I know some old people that are far from God. Mm -hmm. I know some young people that love Jesus with all their heart. So it's not about your age and passing on it. It's about everybody has to have their own personal experience with Jesus, period. Yeah. That's Galatians 3.26 says, you are all sons and daughters through faith in Jesus Christ. God has no grandchildren, only children. Hmm. And it's the faith that Amen. has to be passed on, but each person has a choice. You know, we are, we are the, the beggars telling the other beggars where to find bread, but until they receive it for themselves, then they don't experience it. Uh, I've told the young people in our church, I really believe that God wants to raise up a generation of young people who will believe this word, who will live and walk in the things of God without the, the unbelief and the compromise of my generation and previous generations. But I tell them, you have to take that by faith. You have to be willing to do it. Set everything else aside and pursue Jesus like you've never even seen us do it. Mm -hmm. And I believe that God will do that as they experience faith in him. Paul commends Timothy for the faith that was passed on through his grandmother and through his mother and on to him. But he's commended because that faith has been passed on, not that he shares the faith of his grandmother or his mother. Uh, each generation has to decide who is Jesus to me, to us. And when they, when they make that decision, sometimes it's, it is based very heavily on who he was to the previous generation. Um, sometimes that's the worst possible standard to have because we didn't have faith that was modeled to us very well. So um, there, there are things where I think it's the curse of each generation to just look at the new one and go, oh, my gosh. But the, the kids eventually will be all right. Excellent. And on that note, we'll end. Thank you very much. This has been some great spirited discussion today. And uh, I'd like to say to our audience, I want to encourage you, these same ministers will be back again next week. If you think you enjoyed them this week, wait till next week. <laughs> that puts them under pressure, yeah. doesn't it? <laughs> wait till next week. Yeah. <laughs> no, we thank you for being with us. And, and gentlemen, we thank you for being with us as well. And stay tuned for next week. We'll, we'll see you then. Bye-bye. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.